Poems of Nature by Henry David Thoreau Introduction The 50 poems here brought together under the poems of nature are perhaps two-thirds of those which Thoreau preserved. Many of them are printed by him in whole or in part among his early contributions to Emerson's style or in his own two volumes, The Week and Walden, which were all that were issued in his lifetime. Others were given to Mrs. Sanborn for publication by Sophia Thoreau the year after her brother's death. Several appeared in the Boston Commonwealth in 1863 or have been furnished from time to time by Mr. Blake, his literary executor. Most of Thoreau's poems were composed early in his life before his 26th year. Just now, he wrote in the autumn of 1841, I am in the mid-sea of verses, and they actually rustle round me as the leaves would drown the head of Autumnus himself, should he thrust it up through some veins which I know. But alas, many of them are but crisped and yellow leaves like his, I fear, and will deserve no better fate than to make mould for new harvests. After 1843, he seems to have written but few poems, and had destroyed perhaps as many as he had retained because they did not meet the exacting requirements of his friend Emerson, upon whose opinion at that time he placed great reliance. This loss was regretted by Thoreau in after years, when the poetical habit had left him, for he fancied that some of the verses were better than his friend had supposed. But Emerson, who seldom changed his mind, adhered to his verdict, and while praising some of the poems high, perhaps extravagantly, would admit but a small number of them to the slight selection which he appended to the posthumous edition of Thoreau's letters, edited by him in 1865. And even these were printed, in some instances, in an abbreviated and imperfect form. A few other poems with some translations from the Greek have lately been included by Thoreau's Boston publishers in the volume of Miscellanies, volume 10 of the Riverside edition, 1894. But no collection so full as the present one has ever been offered to the public. It has not been attempted to make this a complete collection of Thoreau's poems, because, as has been well said, many of them seem to be merely pendants to his prose discourse, dropped in as forcible epigrams where they are brief, and in other instances made ancillary to the idea just expressed, or to perpetuate a distinct conception that has some vital connection with the point from which it was poured forth. It is therefore almost an injustice to treat them separately at all. After the discontinuance of the dial, Thoreau ceased to publish his verses as separate poems, but interpolated them in the manner described in his prose essays, where they form a sort of accompaniment to the thought, and from which it is in many cases impossible to detach them. That he himself set some value on them in this connection may be gathered from a sentence in the last of his published letters in which he writes to a correspondent, I'm pleased when they say that in the week you like especially those little snatches of poetry interspersed through the book, for these, I suppose, are the least attractive to most readers. Everything that concerns a great writer has its special interest, and Thoreau's poetry, whatever its intrinsic value may be, is full of personal significance. In fact, as Emerson remarked, his biography is in his verses. Thus, many of these poems will be found to throw light on certain passages of his life. Inspiration, for example, is the record of his soul's awakening to the new impulse of transcendentalism. The stanzas on sympathy, perhaps, contain in thinly disguised form the story of his youthful love and the sacrifice which he imposed on himself to avoid rivalry with his brother. The lines to my brother refer to the sudden and tragic death of John Thoreau in 1842, and the departure is believed to be the poem in which Henry Thoreau, when leaving in 1843 the home of Emerson, where he had lived for two years, took farewell of his friends. The numerous are the allusions to the life and scenery of Concord with which Thoreau's own life was so closely blended require no comment or explanation. 
Thoreau's view of the poetic character, as stated by him in the week, is illustrative of his own position. A true poem, he says, is distinguished not so much by a felicitous expression or any thought it suggests as by the atmosphere which surrounds it. There are two classes of men called poets. The one cultivates life, the other art. One seeks food for nutriment, the other for flavor. One satisfies hunger, the other gratifies the palate. There can be no doubt to which of these classes Thoreau himself belongs. If metrical skill be insisted on as an indispensable condition of poetry, he can hardly be ranked among the poets. Nor, where this criterion was dominant, was it surprising that, as one of his contemporaries tells us, with reference to his verses in the dial, an unquenchable laughter like that of the gods at Vulcan's limping went up over his ragged and haunting lines. But in the appreciation of poetry, there is a great deal more to be considered than this. And as the same writer has remarked, there is a frank and unpretending nobleness in many of Thoreau's verses, distinguished as they are at their best by the right fullness of thought, quiet gravity of tone, and epigrammatic terseness of expression. The title of poet could hardly be withheld from the author of such truly powerful pieces as The Fall of the Leaf, Winter Memories, Smoke in Winter, or inspiration. Nor should it be forgotten that Thoreau was always regarded as a poet by those who were associated with him. Poet Naturalist was a suggestive title which Ellery Channing applied to him, and Hawthorne remarked that his thoughts seemed to measure and attune themselves into spontaneous verse, as he rightfully may, since there is real poetry in them. Even Emerson's final estimate was far from unappreciative. His poetry, he wrote in his biographical sketch, might be good or bad. He no doubt wanted a lyric facility and technical skill, but he had the source of poetry in his spiritual perception. His own verses are often rude and defective. The gold does not yet run pure, is drossy and crude. The time and marjoram are not yet honey. But if he want lyric fineness and technical merits, if he have not the poetic temperament, he never lacks the causal thought, showing that his genius was better than his talent. Perhaps what Thoreau said of Qualls, one of that school of gnomic poets of which he was a student, might be aptly applied to himself. It is rare to find one who was so much of a poet and so little of an artist. Hopelessly quaint, he never doubts his genius. It is only he and his God in all the world. He uses language sometimes as greatly as Shakespeare, and though there is not much straight grain in him, there is plenty of rough, crooked timber. The affinity of Thoreau's style to that of Herbert, Don, Cowley, and other minor Elizabethans has often been remarked and has been truly said that the stanzas seek a vita might also have a niche in Herbert's temple. It must be granted, then, that Thoreau, whatever his limitations, had the poet's vision, and sometimes the poet's divine faculty. And if this was manifested more frequently in his masterly prose, it was neither absent from his verse nor from the whole tenor of his character. It was his destiny to be one of the greatest prose writers whom America has produced, and he had a strong, perhaps an exaggerated sense of the dignity of his calling. Great prose, he thinks, of equal elevation commands our respect more than great verse, since it implies a more permanent and level thought, a life more pervaded with the grandeur of the thought. The poet only makes an eruption like a Parthian and is off again, shooting while he retreats. But the prose writer has conquered like a Roman and settled colonies. If, therefore, we cannot unreservedly place Thoreau among the poetical brotherhood, we may at least recognize that he was a poet in the larger sense in which his friends so regarded him. He felt, thought, acted, and lived as a poet, though he did not always write as one. In his own words, My life has been the poem I would have writ, but I could not both live and utter it. 
Such qualities dignify life and make the expression of it memorable, not perhaps immediately to the multitude of readers, but at first to an appreciative few and eventually to a wide circle of mankind. Nature O oh, nature, I do not aspire to be the highest in thy choir, to be a meteor in the sky, or comet that may range on high, only a zephyr that may blow among the reeds by the river low. Give me thy most privy place, where to run my airy race. In some withdrawn on public mead, let me sigh upon a reed, or in the woods with leafy din, whisper the still evening in. Some still work give me to do, only be it near to you. For I'd rather be thy child and pupil in the forest wild than be the king of men elsewhere and most sovereign slave of care to have one moment of thy dawn than share the city's year forlorn. Inspiration Whatever we leave to God, God does and blesses us. The work we choose should be our own. God leaves alone. If with light head erect I sing, though all the muses lend their force, from my poor love of anything, the verse is weak and shallow as its source. But if with bended neck I grope, listening behind me for my wit, with faith superior to hope, more anxious to keep back than forward it, making my soul accomplice there, unto the flame my heart hath lit, then will the verse for ever wear. Time cannot bend the line which God hath writ. Always the general show of things floats in review before my mind, and such true love and reverence brings that sometimes I forget that I am blind. But now there comes unsought, unseen, some clear divine electuary, and I, who had but sensual been, grew sensible, and as God is, am weary. I hearing get who had but ears, and sight who had but eyes before. I moments live who lived but ears, and truth discern who knew but learning's lore. I hear beyond the range of sound, I see beyond the range of sight, new earths and skies and seas around, and in my day the sun doth peel his light. A clear and ancient harmony pierces my soul through all its din, as through its utmost melody further behind than they, further within. More swift its bolt than lightning is, its voice than thunder is more loud. It doth expand my privacies to all, and leave me single in the crowd. It speaks with such authority, with so serene and lofty tone, that idle time runs gadding by, and leaves me with eternity alone. Now chiefly is my natal hour, and only now my prime of life. Of manhood's strength it is the flower, to species end and war's beginning strife. It comes in summer's broadest noon, by a grey wall or some chance place, unseasoning time, insulting June, and vexing day with its presuming face. Such fragrance round my coach it makes, more rich than our Arabian drugs, that my soul sends its life and wakes the body up beneath its perfumed drugs. Such is the muse, the heavenly maid, the star that guides a mortal course, which shows where life's true kernels laid, its wheat's fine flower and its undying force. She with one breath attunes the spheres and also my poor human heart with one impulse propels the years around and gives my throbbing pulse its start. I will not doubt for evermore, nor falter from a steadfast faith, for though the system be turned over, God takes not back the word which once he saith. I will not doubt the love untold, which not my worth nor want has bought, which wooed me young and woos me old, and to this evening hath me brought. My memory I'll educate to know the one historic truth, remembering to the latest date the only true and sole immortal youth. Be but thy inspiration given, no matter through what danger sought, I'll fathom hell or climb to heaven, and yet esteem that cheap which love has bought. 
Fame cannot tempt the bard who's famous with his god, nor laurel him reward who has his maker's nod. See Kabita. It is but thin soil where we stand. I have felt my roots in a richer air this. I have seen a bunch of violets in a glass vase, tied loosely with a straw which reminded me of myself. Thoreau in the week. I am a parcel of vain strivings tied, by a chance born together, dangling this way and that. Their links were made so loose and wide, methinks, for milder weather. A bunch of violets without their roots, and sorrel intermixed, encircled by a wisp of straw, once coined about their shoots, the law by which I am fixed. A nosegay which time clutched from out those fair Elysian fields, with weeds and broken stems in haste, doth make the rabble rock that waste the day he yields. And here I bloom for a short hour unseen, Drinking my juices up with no root in the land to keep my branches green, but stand in a bare cup. Some tender buds were left upon my stem in mimicry of life, but ah, the children will not know till time has withered them the woe with which they rife. But now I see I was not plucked for naught, and after in life's ways of glass set, well I might survive, but by a kind hand brought alive to a strange place. That stock, thus thin, will soon redeem its hours, and by another year, such as God knows, with freer air, more fruits and fairer flowers will bear, while I droop here. The Fisher's Boy my life is like a stroll upon the beach, as near the ocean's edge as I can go. My tardy steps, its waves sometimes overreach, sometimes I stay to let them overflow. My sole employment is, and scrupulous care, to place my gains beyond the reach of tides, each smoother pebble and each shell more rare which ocean kindly to my hand confides. I have but few companions on the shore, they scorn the strand who sail upon the sea. Yet oft I think the ocean they sailed over is deeper known upon the strand to me. The middle sea contains no crimson tools. Its deeper waves cast up no pearls to view. Along the shore my hand is on its pulse, and I converse with many a shipwrecked crew. The Atlantides the friend is some fair floating isle of palms eluding the marina in Pacific seas. Note from the week. The smothered streams of love which flow, more bright than phlegethon, more low, island us ever, like the sea, in an Atlantic mystery. Our feeble shows none ever reach, no marina has found our beach. Scarcely our mirage now is seen, and neighbouring waves with floating green. Yet still the oldest charts contain some dotted outline of our main. In ancient times, midsummer days, unto the western island's gaze, to Tenerife and the Azores have shown our faint and cloud-like shores. But sink not yet, ye desolate isles, anon your coast with commerce mines, and richer freeds ye'll furnish far than Africa or Malabar. Be fair, be fertile evermore, ye rumoured but untrodden shore. Princes and monarchs will contend, who first unto your lands shall send, and pawn the jewels of the crown, to call your distant soil their own. Sea and land are but his neighbours, and companions in his labours. Who on the ocean's verge and firm land's end doth long and truly seek his friend? Many men dwell far inland, but he alone sits on the strand. Whether he ponders men or books, always still he seaward looks. Marine news he ever reads, and the slightest glances heeds, feels the sea breeze on his cheek, at each word the landsmen speak. In every companion's eye a sailing vessel doth descry. In the ocean's sullen roar from some distant port he hears of wrecks upon a distant shore. 
and the ventures of past years. The Aurora of Guido, a fragment. The god of day his car rolls up the slopes, reining his prancing steeds with steady hand. The lingering moon through western shadow gropes, while morning sheds its light over sea and land. Castles and cities by the sounding mean resound with all the busy din of life. The fisherman unfurls her sails again, and the recruited warrior bites the strife. The early breeze ruffles the poplar leaves, the curling waves reflect the unseen light. The slumbering sea with the day's impulse heaves, while over the western hill retires the drowsy night. The seabirds dip their bills in ocean's form, far circling out over the frothy waves. Sympathy Lately, alas, I knew a gentle boy, whose features all were cast in virtue's mould. As one she had designed for beauty's toy, but after manned him for her own stronghold. On every side he open was his day, that you might see no lack of strength within, for walls and ports do only serve all way for a pretense to feebleness and sin. See not that Caesar was victorious, with toil and strife who stormed the house of fame. In other sense this youth was glorious, himself a kingdom wheresoever he came. No strength went out to get him victory, when all was income of its own accord, for where he went none other was to see, but all were parcel of their noble lord. He forayed like the subtle haze of summer, that still he shows fresh landscapes to our eyes, and revolutions works without a murmur, or rustling of a leaf beneath the skies. So was I taken unawares by this, I quite forgot my homage to confess, Yet now I'm forced to know the hard it is. I might have loved him, had I loved him less. Each moment, as we nearer drew to each other, a stone respect withheld us further yet, so that we seemed beyond each other's reach and less acquainted than when first we met. We two were one, while we did sympathize, so could we not the simplest bargain drive, and what awaits it, now that we are wise, if absence doth the stubbornness contrive? Eternity may not the chance repeat, but I must tread my single way alone, in sad remembrance that we once did meet, and know that bliss irrevocably gone. The spheres henceforth my elegy shall sing, for elegy has other subject none. Each strain of music in my eyes shall ring, knell of departure from that other one. Make haste and celebrate my tragedy, with fitting strain resound ye woods and fields. Sorrow is dearer in such case to me than all the joys other occasion yields. Isn't then too late the damage to repair, distance forsooth from my weak grasp has reft, the empty husk and clutched the useless tear, but in my hands the wheat and kernel left. If I but love that virtue which he is, though it be scented in the morning air, still shall we be truest acquaintances, nor mortals know sympathy more rare. Friendship friends, Romans, countrymen, and lovers. Let such pure hate still under prop, our love that we may be each other's conscience and have our sympathy mainly from thence. We'll one another treat like gods and all the faith we have in virtue and in truth bestow on either and suspicion leave to gods below. Two solitary stars unmeasured systems far between us roll, but by a conscious light we are determined to one pole. What need confound the sphere love can afford to wait? 
for it no hours too late that witnesseth one duties end or to another doth beginning lend. It will subserve no use more than the tints of flowers, only the independent guest frequents its powers, inherits its bequest. No speech, the kind, has it, but kinder of silence stones unto its mates, by night consoles, by day congratulates. What seeth the tongue to tongue, what heareth year of year, by the decrees of fate, from year to year, does it communicate? Pathless the gulf of feeling yawns, no trivial bridge of words, or arch of bolder span, can leap the moat that girds the sincere man. No show of bolts and bars can keep the foreman out, or escape her secret mind, who entered with a doubt that drew the line. No warder at the gate can let the friendly in, but like the sun, or all, he will the castle win and shine along the wall. There's nothing in the world I know that can escape from love, for every depth it goes below and every height above. It waits as waits the sky until the clouds go by, yet shine serenely on with an eternal day alike when they're gone and when they stay. Implicable as love, foes may be bought or teased from their hostile intent, but he goes unappeased, who is on kindness bent. True Kindness True kindness is a pure divine affinity, not founded upon human consanguinity. It is a spirit, not a blood relation superior to family and station. To the Maiden in the East Lo, in the eastern sky is set thy glancing eye, and though its gracious light never riseth to my sight, yet every star that climbs above the gnarled limbs of yonder hill conveys thy gentle will. Believe I knew thy thought, and that the zephyrs brought the kindest wishes through, as mine they bear to you, that some attentive cloud did pause amid the crowd over my head, while gentle things were said. Believe the thrushes sung, and that the flower bells rung, that herbs exhaled their scent, and beasts knew what was meant, the trees a welcome waved, and lakes their margins laved, when thy free mind to my retreat did wind. It was a summer eve, the air did gently heave, while yet a low-hung cloud, thy eastern skies did shroud. The lightning's silent gleam, startling my drowsy dream, seemed like the flash under thy dark eyelash. From yonder comes the sun, but soon his course is run, rising to trivial day along his dusty way. But thy noontide completes only auroral heats, nor ever sets to hasten vain regrets. Direct thy pensive eye into the western sky, and when the evening star does glimmer from afar, upon the mountain line, accept it for a sign, that I am near, and thinking of thee here. I'll be thy mercury, thou superior to me, distinguished by thy face, the earth shall learn my place. As near beneath thy light will I outwear the night, with mingled ray leading the westward way. Still will I strive to be, as if thou wert with me. Whatever path I take, it shall be for thy sake. Of gentle slope and wide, as thou wert by my side, without a route to trip thy gentle foot. I'll walk with gentle pace, and choose the smoothest place, and careful dip the oar, and shun the winding shore, and gently steer my boat where water lilies float, and cardinal flowers stand in the sylvan bowers. Free Love 
My love must be as free as was the eagle's wing, hovering over land and sea and everything. I must not dim my eye in thy saloon, I must not leave my sky a nightly moon. Be not the fowler's net which stays my flight, and craftily is set to allure the sight. But be the favouring gale that bears me on, and still doth fill my sail when thou art gone. I cannot leave my sky for thy caprice. True love would soar as high as heaven is. The eagle would not brook her mate thus one, who trained his eye to look beneath the sun. Rumours from the Aeolian Harp There is a veil which none hath seen, where foot of man has never been. Such as here lives with toil and strife, an anxious and a sinful life. There every virtue has its birth, ere it descends upon the earth, and thither every deed returns, which in the generous bosom burns. There love is warm, and youth is young, and poetry is yet unsung. For virtue still adventures there, and freely breathes her native air. And ever, if you hearken well, you still may hear its whisper bell, and tread of high souled men go by, their thoughts conversing with the sky. Music